Dan drives. He was the mechanic of the year in 1994 and went into the Western Auto Mechanics Hall of Fame. He's been around the sport for about 20 years. And he spent a good bit of time with Randy Pemberton starting from the time they get the car in the shop from Laughlin until they get it set up and ready to go racing. Now, it's a multi-part series, so Randy has the first part today. When a team such as Roush Racing receives a chassis from car builder Mike Laughlin, there is still a lot of work to be done before that race car ever gets its first green flag. We've built a lot of cars here, We're, you know, since 19, the fall of 1987, we've built 46 race cars here, and we keep real good track of our hours to understand what all this costs. You know, you need to know before you go to do a second team what the first team costs and what have you. So, so we have the advantage of knowing almost to the minute how long it takes us to build a race car. So from the time we roll a car out of our trailer that we picked up from Mike Laughlin till the time we roll it back in the trailer, painted, plumbed, front end set, engine fired ready to go is usually about 18 days and that'd be 18 days probably an average of six guys working on it a day so it'd be 18 times eight times six whatever that'd be so it's it's number of hours to get a winston cup car ready and by the time a car is ready to race it costs a lot of money i bet by the time you you spent thirty thirty five thousand dollars on an engine and, and bought a surface plate car and factored in all the labor and all the materials and hose ends and headers and tailpipes things of that nature there's no way you don't have seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars in a race car that you built largely on your own. There are, as Steve said, a lot of factors that have to be considered when building a Winston Cup car and building one that handles well. The first thing is deciding what the measurements for the front snout should be and for which tracks. You you can't tell by looking, uh -huh. if you will. It's a standard Mike Laughlin snout. This is the snout from here. To there and it's all the suspension pickup points the steering the lower control arms the upper control arms and, and what mike will do is he'll put it on at any height off the ground he has a standard height and, and that's what I, we call a standard car and then there's a low snout the old low snout was an inch and a half low from standard that he would actually put the snout on physically an inch and a half lower than standard well then people said they wanted half lows and a lot of people thought that meant it was a half low but it's actually a half of an inch and a half low so it's three quarters low so they're they're Probably what most people are running right now on the flat tracks. Uh -huh. What this car is, as a matter of fact, and this car sat on three poles for Ted on flat tracks this year, is a is what I call a half low, which is a three quarter of an inch lower than standard front snout. And everywhere else we run standard Mike Laughlin front snout. So, yeah. so you hear a lot of halves, three quarters inch and a half, what have you. But it's most of the cars are either standard or three quarters of an inch lower. That brings us to the all important front end geometry of a Winston Cup car. Let's begin with front and rear steer. I hate to sound ignorant, but what are these bars down there? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the steering gear. You know, naturally, this is a front steer car, which is like you said before, almost everybody's running. Front steer just means that the steering box is in front of the front wheels. It doesn't uh -huh. mean that the front steer, front wheel steer and the rear steer car, the rear wheel steer. Right. It's not like a fire truck. It's front steer versus rear steer is just the steering box is here. Our rear steer, the steering box is, is here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, here's the pitman arm, which, uh -huh. which hooks the, the steering box. To the to the idler arm, mm -hmm. to the to the center link which hooks it to the idler arm, and then here are the tie rods which go out to the tire. So as the as the steering box turns, the driver turns the wheel, goes through a worm and nut here, which turns this shaft, mm -hmm. and the pitman arm and the idler arm swing in an arc like this, and you can see that drags the center link to right. the right or to the left and pulls the pulls the tie rods, which actually aims the wheel. So, mm -hmm. you know, you say, well, that's not a big. This deal. is where the term bump steer is derived. The tie rod is linked to the steering arm, which connects to the spindle, which holds the wheel. All of that interacts with the upper and lower control arms, which are separated by coil springs. Bump steer is this lower control arm moves in this arc, and this tie rod moves in an arc also. You want to keep those as close as possible so that as the spindle comes in and out, the steering arm isn't pushed around by the tie rod. And, and it, for example, if, if, if your lower control arm was this long, and your tie rod was this long. Well, as the, as the lower control arm swung up, it's pulling the ball joint in. Right. But the tie rod is so long, it's gonna try to push the steering arm out. So as, as the suspension travel, all of a sudden, the right front tire is aiming this way. Mm -hmm. The driver can just say, man, I don't understand. I'm, I'm turning this far and it's just terrible. By the same token, if the opposite were in, in effect, mm -hmm. and it turned it this way, the driver starts off down in the corner and suddenly the car goes over there. He says, man, I'm turning the wheel and suddenly it takes a big bite and I'm driving through the infield. I'm over the curve at Martinsville. Mm -hmm. So what you try to do, is adjust the height of this center link mm -hmm. so that your tie rods scribe the same arc as the lower control arm. 
All of the lower control arms are standard size. The uppers are not, and they are key. The bottom line is uh, all different sizes for all different tracks, basically? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. the, the location of this ball joint right here. That right there. Is what is what we're trying to control. You know, it, it moves in and out this way for camber. It moves front and rear this way for caster. Mm -hmm. So you go to Martinsville with three degrees of caster, and it puts this ball joint here, and you want five degrees of camber, and it would put it back in here. Mm -hmm. And if you went to, to Daytona, you're going to have like six degrees of caster, which would put the ball joint back further, mm -hmm. but you may only have one and a half to two degrees of camber, so it goes back out. So this ball here moves all over the place in your fixture. Well, folks, that is just a part of what Steve Mill has to tell us about setting up a race car. By the time we get to the Daytona 500, you'll know how to build your own race car. He'll be on for the next several weeks, so you be sure to plan to be with us, too. Still to come on this edition of Inside Winston Cup Racing, we'll have the mailbox and also a conversation by Mike Laughlin and how to find the desired height of the front snout, front and rear steer cars, how the steering gear works, and what the pieces are that turn the front wheels. Also, the position of those pieces as it relates to the term bump steer. This week we start with the terms caster and camber as they relate to the front wheels. Both caster and camber can be adjusted by the size of the upper control arm and the spacers or shims that are placed between the control arm and the frame of the car. This is the upper control arm. Now, you guys make these pieces, don't you? You design these and make these? Or? Yeah, you go to, you know, you want the, the right front tire to gain camber at a different rate for different racetracks. Like we talked about earlier with a banked racetrack, you don't need to gain as much camber because the racetrack's gaining the camber, if you will. It tips up for you. But you go to Martinsville, Wilkesboro, Pocono, Indianapolis, places like that, the racetrack stays flat. The car rolls over, so pretty soon the tire is all mm -hmm. out of the correct angle to keep the contact patch on the ground. So you end up building a shorter upper control arm for there and putting in more static camber. For example, at Daytona, you'll run a one and a half to two degrees of negative camber in the right front. Mm -hmm. And you go to a place like uh, Martinsville with five or five and a half. So you want that tire moving. First off, it starts out more tipped in at the top. And with a short control arm, it pulls it in as the suspension goes right. through travel and makes even more camber. That allows the contact face. Mm -hmm. of the of the tire to stay on the racetrack as much as possible and that's what you want you want all four tires doing all they can all the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. you well, you can adjust that with the shim yeah you, you would build a shorter than normal a-frame when you went to martin's on on top of that you have some adjustment here you know you mm -hmm. just loosen these these bolts and slide a shim in or take a shim out and you also set your caster with that you know you can also mm -hmm. you can also tip the spindle front to rear at the top with the upper control arm for example you would mm -hmm. take a wash her out, uh, a shim out here and put it in here, that oh. skews it like this, that pulls the upper ball joint back, and now the, the, the spindle goes from like this to like that. Mm -hmm. That's caster. The more caster you have in it, the easier the car is to drive, which is one of the benefits the power steering brought. The most reliable way to see if your caster and camber are correct on the car at a particular track is by measuring tire temperatures. Are shims something that you, you take in and out at racetracks when you're, when you're trying to dial these cars? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, uh, you, you go run a little bit and uh, go and get your Goodyear tire sheet from the Goodyear engineers out there on pit road. You see them sticking the tires, and you read your temperatures. The temperatures are measured on the inside edge, the middle, and the outside of each tire. For example, if the inside of the tire was quite a bit hotter than the outside of the tire, it means that the tire is tipped up too much in the corners riding on the inside edge. So you either need to take some shims out and, and let it lay out at the top so it, right. it's a little bit flatter. Or if you run out of shims, you need to end up with a little bit longer ball joint that physically moves the ball joint mm -hmm. further out. So, yeah, you tune that. And then, like we talked about before, you, you tune caster for driver feel. You know, uh, yeah. there, there's different caster from right to left in the race mm -hmm. car. You know, you don't, you don't run the same caster right to left. And, and the more you put in the right, the more it's going to help the car turn in. And as you take some out of left, it will turn in better. And, you, and the driver can get out and say, man, this thing turns in too good. Well, you would close that split down. You know, if you had five degrees here and and three here and mark it out to me, that thing just really turns way too easy getting in the corner. Well, you might go to four and three or five and four, depending on what Mark wanted to do. And that will take some of the, some of the no effort turning yeah. out of the car. Yeah. You know, you're driving yeah. down the highway in your car and you turn loose the wheel, it goes straight. Well, this, mm -hmm. this race car is going to turn left. Mm -hmm. And you can tune that by how much static caster you have in the car. There are many other adjustments a team has to make when trying to get a car to handle. There are sway bars, and then there are the all-important springs and shocks. The springs are different lengths and different size coils, and they're rated for how much pressure or weight they can withstand. Different size springs for different corners of the car, and of course, for different racetracks. 
Now, let's look at the shops. It's one piece that we didn't look at very closely five or, or really? ten years ago. Right now, there's, there's a lot of focus on shock absorbers, and, and they're making a big difference. You know, they control the ride height. They control... If you took the springs out of the car, the shock absorbers wouldn't hold it up. But right. they would slow down the amount of time it would take for it to hit the floor. It, right. you, you know, it would, it, would be, it would take longer to bottom out with the shock absorbers. And you control how the body rolls on a flat track. You control how the nose picks up on a super speedway. You know, there, there are just so many things about shock absorbers. And, and there are so many avenues towards success. Some people run real stiff shocks with a lot of control, and some people run real soft shocks with hardly any control. Some people work on their left fronts a lot. We work on our right rear a lot. You know, it's just wow. nobody has... It's not like springs and wedge where everybody says, well, Charlotte, you run this spring in the right front and this spring in the left front, and you run this much wedge, and here's how high the roof is. You've kind of got that figured out. Now with shocks it runs the gamut you know i would say that you could take the top 10 cars and just about exchange all their springs and you'd be, you'd be close and same with their front end setups and same with where their body setback is and things of that nature and their weight but you change the four shock absorbers amongst the top 10 teams that they i think they would be drastically different we hope you're learning as much as we are and folks we're learning from one of the absolute best in the business we'll have more on next week with steve meal still to come on this edition of inside winston cup racing we'll have the mailbox and also highlights of the NASCAR Bush Series banquet, so don't go away. Teaching children to save is a good idea. Uh, the changing stuff at the racetrack, you know, we see you guys messing with the, with the front fenders, and I know there are rules and limits to how much you can do. You talk about downforce and make the car cut through the air and stuff. That is also one of the things, I guess, that you guys can't adjust at the racetrack. Yeah, the wider the front fenders, the more front downforce it makes. The more drag it makes, too. So you're not going to go to Daytona and Talladega with great big wide front fenders. And that's for two reasons, not just drag, you know, but drag is the primary issue because that slows you down, restricted engines, you don't have a ton of horsepower to play with. The other thing is it would make too much front downforce. And you're working real hard to not use any more spoiler on the rear than you, than you need to for, for driver comfort and balance of the race car at Daytona and Talladega. So if you're limiting at the back or, or limiting yourself at the back, you would also limit yourself at the front. You don't want to make so much downforce that pushes the car down in the racetrack and all of a sudden the rear end's not hooked up like it used to be. So, mm -hmm. so uh, on the other hand, you go to Martinsville, Wilkesboro, uh, probably Phoenix, maybe New Hampshire, you want to work the front tires and you want to work the back tires. So you jack the back of the race car up, put a 70 degree spoiler on it, make a bunch of rear downforce. Mm -hmm. Now the complaint is, man, the front's not working. It doesn't feel like I'm stuck. The car doesn't roll through like right. we talked about earlier. So then you go back and say, we've got a problem. We need to make some front downforce. You pull your front fenders out as far as you can get them. Make big front fenders, big big round ugly tank looking armadillo kind of front fenders that makes front downforce then you, then you say well what about the drag half mile three quarter mile mile racetracks drag probably isn't an issue if you can go through the corners faster you'll run faster up the straightaway so so you just go ahead and build a great big front end run on a short track probably don't adjust the fender width you know that they're the, they can be no wider than 76 inches they'd be 176 inches if they let us to make front downforce but usually a short tracks, you'll set them at 76 inches and just go. Now at Daytona, you tune a lot because you're going fast, you're thinking about downforce, which affects the balance, and you're thinking about drag because you haven't got a lot of horsepower. So, yeah, there's quite a bit of tuning going on in front fenders, and we didn't even address that until five years ago. But, but it's interesting. Uh, front grill area, we watch you guys uh, when you, you tape off a car to qualify and everything. Is there, a lot of, is there a lot of leeway here that you can work with? Is it, I mean, obviously, sometimes you'll run, that thing will be like totally taped off, just maybe just a crack open when you qualify. Yeah. Is that, tell us the difference between like qualifying and racing. What do you do there? Uh, there again, how much, how many holes there are in the front of the car mm -hmm. affect the drag and the downforce. Mm -hmm. If the car was completely sealed off, if you, if you taped the grill completely off, there'd be less drag because there's fewer holes for the air to go through. But there'd be more downforce because there's fewer air, fewer holes for the air to escape through. So the, instead of instead of the air pushing through a screen wire and going right on through the car, it pushes on tape and pushes the race car down. So you end up taping the car for qualifying based on if a the car is tight enough that the driver can stand it, b if the engine has enough cooling capacity that it won't get hot. So typically you go to a place like Charlotte and you, you tune your car for a lot of tape because you want the you don't want to pay a drag penalty by having too much open. But then you say, ooh, I don't want to get them too loose when we tape it all the way off. So the driver's thinking, well, when you put some more tape on, it'll be a little bit looser. So he won't tune to the nth degree. And then before qualifying, you, you cool the engine down with icy cold, ice cold water, and, and you've got a big radiator and a thermostat and all kinds of things working for you. And you understand that you can run one or two laps without overheating the engine. So that's qualifying. You need to understand it's going to get too loose. You're going to understand it. If, if you want to pay a drag penalty or not, you're going to understand if the engine's going to overheat. Then you get ready to race. Well, you saw at Darlington last fall, 
there are a lot of issues there. You know, short tracks, you run all the openings you can get. There's, there's brake cooling, there's all kinds of heat. They're nose to tail for three or four hours at a time, you know. So you gotta worry about if your radiator's gonna stand it. You can't overheat an engine. So you spend Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon worrying, worrying about your tape combination. You know, looking, really? feeling, wondering how much open you, you'll hear Mark on radio, you can take another half inch off the oil and maybe an inch on the, on the water. And, or I, you know, this thing is 170 degrees, I want it to run 200 degrees, put some more tape on the water. You know, and then you decide where you want to put the tape based on how much downforce you want to make. Oh, really? the, if, if you take the bottom of the grill off and leave the top open, that will make more front downforce than if you take the top off and left the bottom open. So that's a little tuning thing too. You know, well, Mark wants to put another inch on, and if you had the new guy doing it, he just put tape on. No, the crew says, no, no, we want to put it on the top, for instance, because we're already a little bit loose or getting toward loose. Let's not make any more front downforce. It's it's a, it's a little tuning thing, and it's a, it's a thing you'll find crew chiefs looking at each other and see who's got what and how much they got open and wondering about the size of their radiators and who's going to overheat and who's not. And then you kind of hedge your bets. You'll see that most of these cars on Sunday will have like an extra inch of tape folded over on yeah, the I've end, that, and right. you can pull an inch off as it, as it gets hot. And sometimes you'll add it if it if it doesn't get warm enough to what the driver wants to see or what the engine builder wants to see. So you'll see people taking tape off, putting tape on. It's a little tuning thing we use. The biggest thing we've got to worry about is you can't overheat the engine. Hard to believe that duct tape should play such an important role in setting up a NASCAR Winston Cup car, but it really does. And Steve Mill will continue with the story on aerodynamics along with Randy right after this break. So you stay with me. You know, aerodynamics play a different role on different racetracks. Normally, we think of aerodynamics on the high-speed racetracks like Daytona and Talladega. Well, it's important there. What they want to do is have the air slip across the car with as little drag as possible so that the car will run faster. But it's important, too, on the short tracks. There, they try to achieve downforce on the car Steve Mill explained what goes on with aerodynamics at different racetracks. Yeah, the aero right now is just just really big. I would it, it'd be it'd be real easy to say we're probably making three times the total downforce we were three years ago. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of people working real hard. In the old days, you'd say wind tunnel. Okay, that's January. We're going to take the Daytona car. I'm going to try to work on having the smallest car. Don't care about the downforce. Just want to know drag numbers. Now you say wind tunnel. You're going five times a year with. The Martinsville car with the Atlanta car. What do you Road race on? car, maybe. Road race cars. You're working on downforce, you know, downforce, downforce, downforce. And the crew chiefs talk about bodies a lot. Boy, there's a lot, you know. It's one of those tuning things. You know, you talk about what do you think about? Well, there's wedge, there's stagger, there's tire pressure, there's shock absorbers, there's spring rates, there's front to rear weight, there's body. You know, I've, I've said it, Mark said it all, all the guys that race day in and day out. I said, well, I'm not sure this thing's got a good body on it. You know, this thing's got a real good body on it. Remember this thing made a ton of downforce in the tunnel. Remember it didn't make any rear downforce in the tunnel. It's just one more thing you're using to tune, and it's not getting any more confusing. In fact, it's getting a little more clear with the help of, of people that work for the big car companies. They, they brought the knowledge that we needed to really understand. We were out here kind of hacking around, they said, no, guys, here's the deal. This looks like this, and here's the rule of thumb, and they've helped a lot. And the budgets are high, and it's awfully expensive to go to a wind tunnel. Real expensive. Without the big car companies, I, I can't imagine us going near as much as we do right now. Mm -hmm. Ford helps us an awful lot in the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give us an idea. I mean, it's like, what, a couple thousand dollars an hour? To yeah, it's long about $20,000 for an eight-hour shift. It's, it's, it's real expensive. And you couple that with the fact that you don't just go down there and put the car in, right, blow on it, and kick back. you got people that are working on it. You have people here two or three weeks in advance in our shop making pieces to try. You know, we'll go, we'll take an eight-hour shift, and we'll make 24 runs, 22 runs, 26 runs. What are all those runs? They're not little tweaks. They're whole sides. They're roof panels. They're a different roof lap shape. They're a different sport. You know, you end up with a huge pile of stuff that you throw in on the floor and say, okay, let's make some runs and see what's better and see what's worse. And then, and then you do a lot of ciphering, if you will, to figure out what helped and what didn't. But there, there are a lot of man hours involved in wind tunnel work. And we're happy to do it. We're just tickled to death that Ford has allowed us to have the budget to go to the wind tunnel, because without them, we wouldn't be there. And to the naked eye, to us, laymen, just fans of the sport, looking at the pieces you would slap on a car, we probably wouldn't be able to see that much difference, right? Or would we? They would be different, but it would be hard for you to understand why they were better. It's hard for us to understand. We, you know, we're not aerodynamicists, you know, but, but we do watch and we do wonder and we do know what the templates do and what area NASCAR allows us to work in, what areas they don't want us to work in, what areas would be completely contrary to safety and we'd never do something like that. You know, uh, we'd never mess with a roof flap. We'd never roof mess with a spoiler that would flap down for qualifying. You know, our deal is to make a nice, safe, comfortable race car that will run a long time on its tires. And the way you run a long time on your tires is you have the wind 
help you push that car on the track and you're not just relying on the tires trying to grip the car is physically being pushed down on the racetrack and that's where i believe nascar cars have made the most advance of late it's, it's in total downforce mm -hmm. and is do you are you concerned about it? you are concerned about it at martinsville to some degree as opposed to we're concerned time. about martins we're concerned about anywhere it's, it's a just, percentage thing it, it's yeah yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it it I mean, just because you're only running 80 miles an hour doesn't mean you're not making downforce. The thing that Martinsville, Wilkesboro, places like that do for you is you can throw the drag penalty right out. You don't give a hoot that it's more drag. You just want to stick that race car. You know, I, they, they used to have those races up north as run what you brung kind of thing, and guys would come with great big motors, and the guys that came with a regular motor with the wing would whip them, you know, because they were making that downforce. The tires didn't have to work as hard, and over the course of a 100 lap or 50 lap or 200 lap or 500 lap or like at Martinsville, you're going to be in a lot better shape. You're going to be in laps better shape if you're making more downforce. And, and, and the thing about the short tracks is you don't have to worry at all about the drag down. Do you relate it at all to horsepower? Does it equate, I guess? Oh, yeah. Is there, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, something we, that you can put on it? Yeah, the Ford it, engineers it will look at it. five up. horsepower, yes, ten sir. horsepower. They'll look that. at that race car and say, this car, to run 200 miles an hour, for example, this car takes 315 drag horsepower. And you go work on it and put the sport up. Okay, now that made 100 pounds of rear downforce. So the car is being pushed down. 100 pounds better than it was, and the driver will like it a whole lot, but it costs you 30 drag horsepower. So now it's going to run slower up the straightaway. You kind of have to balance that at Daytona and Talladega, but at Atlanta, at Charlotte, at Darlington, man, you just go on and get that down for us, and, and the engine's got more than enough to pull it around there anyway. You know, so so you, you need to be thinking about it. You know, if if you make a ton of downforce and the driver gets out of the car and says, man, I'm killing them in the corners. You, engine, you motor guys, you got to go to work. Now, my car guys, they're just super because they make a ton of downforce. Well, he needs to understand that we car guys are crippling the engine guys by, by using up their drag to make our downforce. So it's all a balance, but, but downforce is really big right now. We learned a lot. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate okay. it. All right, man. We were invited to attend a wind tunnel session with them, but as it turned out, NASCAR was testing some safety features and we didn't want to be a distraction, so we took a rain check on it. Certainly our thanks to Steve Mill for his input the last few weeks. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. We learned from it and hope you did too. We hope to have Steve on later on in the year with updates on the things that he has been talking about.